skill-based matchmaking. The plague of the competitive and casual gaming scene. Across all genres that utilize matchmaking, be it shooters, battle royales, deathmatch, card games, MOBAs, and even real-time strategy. No matter the category, we see pitchforks and torches across online forums and social media, practically begging to abolish the villainous four letters. S-B-M-M. The goal of skill-based matchmaking is to find players of a similar skill. So why do we get matchups that look like this? There are not only 5 ranks between the worst player on team 2 and the best on team 1, but 30% of the player base falls between them talent-wise. Rankings aren't always representative of player skill, but we can assume team 1 would be around 30% better than team 2, nowhere near the same skill level. That's when we log into Twitter and we see the long list of annoyed users criticizing the system. I believe these thoughts are formed by a lack of understanding around the intent of matchmaking. It's commonly believed that balance is the primary focus, but people often underestimate the ways developers can shape your experience. You would imagine things need to be balanced to give you a fair match, but what if they're not looking to give you a fair match? Map elements like choke points, high and low ground, sniper's nest, head glitches, and corridors can shape the entire outcome of a competitive game. And with the rise of weapon types, interactable objects, NPCs, and character abilities, games have become infinitely more complex to balance. Each of these elements are within the dev's responsibility to balance properly based on metrics and data from live matches. The most important thing outside of the dev's control? Player skill. Comparing players' perceived skill is nothing new, but it wasn't always the case. Ever since games started keeping score, we've been going head-to-head -to, -head to see who is the best. Playing games online was always possible since the launch of the internet, but wasn't necessary for the titles releasing at the time. Whether technological constraints or a lack of interest, online gaming just wasn't popular or common until the 90s. In 96, the Quake team hosted dedicated servers for players to cooperate on the campaign or fight against one another. For the most part, this type of online interaction was limited to PCs. There had been a few attempts at consoles with online capabilities, like the PlayStation 2's broadband network in 2000, but the first popular one was really the Xbox network in 2002. I'm going to reset my internet. your mouth a little bit too much. Yeah, that one. As time went on and online gaming quickly rose in popularity, players needed a way to find and connect to servers. Some games advertised with an in-game browser, allowing people to hop from lobby to lobby until they found one they could win in. While that was probably an unintended side effect, there were a lot of unforeseen circumstances. New players could open a server and, very soon after, find themselves battling against Greg. And if you haven't met my boy Greg, just imagine the sweatiest, most try-hard person from whatever game you play. See, the problem is that Greg has 40,000 hours on record and should never even see a new player. This obvious difference in skill could be avoided in games that allowed passwords in their player-made servers, but the second issue is inherent to the peer-to-peer -peer structure of self-hosting. Often in games that would allow players to create their own servers, they would also need to be the host, creating a peer-to-peer -peer network connection. When the host has poor internet, there can be significant delays between communications. If the host disconnects altogether, the game has to stop in order to switch all of the connections to another peer, or close the game entirely. This allows the host to put a pause on his internet connection, run around to update his game, then resume his internet connection to appear to have teleported to get the upper hand on the competition. 
This is essentially the first version of the lag switch. As sorrowful as it is, the tactic gained popularity and the only fix was to automatically time out the host, often ending the match, or use a dedicated server. So the drawbacks of peer-to-peer -peer hosting and server browsers were clear, but for a while, that was the best way to play against other players. Usually, searching for a server meant you had to be aware of it to begin with, which might be difficult if you don't follow the extra steps of joining the forum, making friends, and talking to others willing to share their IP. Server browsers help, but now you're tasked with deciding which lobby you're interested in without knowing anything about the players inside of them. It's a shot in the dark with high hopes you'll never see Greg twice in one day. But luckily, the developers keep data on player-to-player -player interactions and have fixed nearly everything we've mentioned. Intro to matchmaking. The purpose has always been to connect players online automatically. I think there was a brief period where matches were hand-picked, but I'm gonna act like it didn't exist because I don't know much about it and I didn't find much online. The automated process was much more efficient for players looking to find a quick match, which was all people were asking for back then. Matching players based on skill would be a new endeavor explored by none other than the king of FPS themselves. But we'll come back to that. It's important to understand the breakdown of skill and rank. What entails a player's skill is measurable by the system, but is also the direct result of a player's actions and input. It can be a culmination of many metrics, kill death ratio, win percentage, average time survived, shot accuracy, and many other statistics collected during gameplay. The values can be compared player to player using a static scale or a comparison to the average across the population. This creates a skill level that is entirely separate from player rank. Typically, a rank will be the visible factor communicated to the player. Examples like Bronze, Silver, Diamond, or Master are what we see in Apex. Any player's individual rank will go up or down with every match that they play, adjusting based on the specific game's ranking system. Here, it's all laid out pretty clearly. For placing 13th or better, your squad will gain ranked points accordingly. Every kill on a player of equal rank is 10 points, with a clear delta for above or below. Finally, multiply those points based on your placement, up to a max of 125 total kills and assist RP. This type of system is fairly forgiving because the only thing that drops your rating is the cost of entry, which is irrelevant as long as you avoid death. It's pretty easy to see that even players of a lower skill can climb into the gold bracket with little effort. CSGO is slightly different. It seems their skill rating is heavily tied to their ranking system. Low skill players won't rank up unless they get better at all aspects of the game. There's no one way to gain points, unlike in Apex where surviving will get you pretty far. You'll need to consistently outperform your teammates round to round and win the match. Overwatch requires wins to rank up, which means you could be low skill and still climb through the ranks as long as your team is winning, whether or not you contribute. The reason I'm putting so much emphasis on player skill and player rank is because they both play the most important role in a good matchmaking system. How do you present matches that feel fair and balanced, but also provide that sense of personal growth? Getting these matchups as close as possible is important, but how important is your latency? Have you ever even seen a 900 ping match? It looks like this. Like this. Not only sluggish, but literally warping around. Personally, I can feel the difference between 24 ping and even 90 ping with ease. Sometimes shots don't register, and sometimes I get shot through the door. So skill, rank, latency, but what about your account age? Someone who just got the game probably shouldn't face off against those with thousands of hours, right? All of these individual statistics are important, so we can't forget them, but not everybody is lonely. What I mean by that is most people play with their friends and queuing up together throws us off even further. If a high skill player queues up with their low skill buddy, which one do you base your matchmaking off of? Most games will average out the party's skill rating, but now the entire party is in an uneven match. The weight of the match falls on the shoulders of the better player while the lower skill ones get stomped. Some games just take the highest value and match up people accordingly, and some games outright forbid the opportunity to play with friends if your skill level is too high. Overwatch won't even let you queue up with others if you're at the Grandmaster rank. This is just a surface level glimpse at all of the factors that make the decision to put you into the matches that you regularly get. But you may be asking, why is it important to match based on skill in the first place? And that, put simply, is the skill gap.
I've come up with four elements to define the skill gap. The barrier for entry, the floor, the gap itself, and the ceiling. The barrier for entry is, for the most part, irrelevant. Every game has a basic amount of knowledge required to begin playing. Usually, the player will learn this before even acquiring the game. For example, everyone knows that most FPS require you to run around and aim a gun. The majority of competitive titles will offer a tutorial or matches against bots to allow a player to adjust for the barrier for entry. The floor is more important. The skill floor is ever-changing as time passes post-release. I define the skill floor as the basic amount of skills necessary to compete at an average level. These players are good enough to enjoy a few wins every now and then, and likely play a few times a week. As time goes on, the popular strategies, tactics, and tutorials found on YouTube become commonplace. The skill floor moves up as the community as a whole becomes increasingly talented. The skill ceiling is the mastery and understanding of all known mechanics and strategies in a title. To reach the skill ceiling, a player must learn every skill and tactic available in the game. They need to accurately utilize these advantages to consistently beat the competition. It may not be the number one player on the leaderboards, but it's the one who knows every game mechanic to a T. If they exist, even this player continues to learn new strategies and mechanics, making the ceiling constantly rise as well. The gap is where we see an issue relevant to skill-based matchmaking. If the developer ignores individual skill levels, new players may see themselves facing others nearing the skill ceiling. Let's jump back to server browser culture. Back then, the skill ceiling was often high due to technological constraints like some games had major bugs and glitches that were never fixed but deemed as features in the long run. By utilizing these unintended features, the experienced player has a substantial advantage against new or average players, allowing for complete dominance for the entirety of the match. Access to external resources like guides were uncommon, and so were training modes and firing ranges. In a game like Minecraft, these skill gaps would go unnoticed, since Greg can't be much better than any other player. If a competitive shooter like Apex Legends or Call of Duty had traditional server browsers instead of matchmaking, the badges, the weapon skins, the KD, and all of those pride-bearing factors would mean nothing, as you could simply boost on lower-level lobbies or join up against friends to earn them. Games like Among Us and Valheim still use browsers because any form of player versus player has a low skill ceiling. That is to say, Greg can't be much better than the casual or brand new players in these games. They may have maps and weapons and armors to learn, but there aren't many intricate or skill-based tactics that will put a dedicated player above the competition. Here's a fitting example. The Korean third-person shooter Guns the Duel. The game was intended to be played at a fairly slow pace, but animation cancelling allows for an insane amount of inputs, exponentially raising the skill ceiling. Normal inputs allow you to dodge, dash, and wall run, but cancelling the animation to perform another action, then cancelling that one to do the next, allows you to do… well, all of this. Over 30 unique moves for a player to master and use in competition. The footage here is from Air King's Definitive Guns tutorial linked below. While the guns in Respawn's Apex Legends all have strict rules and values surrounding them, the Battle Royale has a high skill ceiling for its movement. The easiest technique is to strafe side to side in a gunfight, like in many first person shooters. The next would be slide jump or crouch spamming, again a beneficial tactic in any FPS, but as we advance through the movement mechanics, we see B hopping, wall jumping, and tap strafing. The developers made Titanfall, a parkouring, mech fighting FPS, but never implemented wall running into Apex Legends. Yet, here we are. A way to effectively imitate that movement discovered over two years after the game's release. For contrast, Minecraft allows you to sprint and swing a sword or shoot a bow. There are potions and enchantments, but it's a stark contrast to the depth found in some competitive titles. An opponent moving in ways not intended by the developers can shock new players, but may also inspire them to learn the same movement techniques. Dedicating time and effort to learning these moves increases the skill gap, allowing players to separate themselves from the competition. Since couch co-op was much more common in the console scene, server browsers and online play probably wasn't a priority for devs in the early 2000s. Around 2004, Bungie single-handedly set the standard for online multiplayer with self-hosting via parties and playlists. 
Yes, when I previously said Kings of FPS, I meant Bungie. The release of Halo 2 was the first skill-based automated matchmaking system, and it was a hit. Playlists would give you types of game modes to choose from to pair you with others interested in the same mode. Parties would allow you to group up with friends before entering the queue for these playlists, allowing you to play online together. These two options were still peer-to-peer, -peer, with one of the players being the host and the rest being connected to them, but this time, the host didn't need to do all of the back-end work on their own. Even in 2004, these two options shipped with skill-based matchmaking. Max Oberman, former Halo 2 multiplayer lead, stated that Bungie only made a distinction between ranked and unranked playlists to help players' perception of their own performance. The only difference between the two was whether or not players could see their skill rating. There's an entire article outlining a brief interview with Oberman written on Vice, linked below. In the same post, they quote the matchmaking expert Josh Mink's statement, When I look at True Skill 2 data, I see ample evidence that matchmaking more tightly on skill leads to significantly less quitting. Four to six times less. Much of matchmaking is loosely inspired by the original ELO system, based on an individual's wins and losses. It was created to rank chess players in their chess proficiency. Basically, every player starts at 1500. If you win a match, you go up, and your opponent goes down. It's a self-balancing system in a one-on-one -on -one format, and the difference between the two players' ratings should predict the outcome of the match. Scaling a system like this to a mass multiplayer level has many downfalls, which is why most algorithms are crafted depending on the title. Each player needs to play enough matches to reach their actual skill level, skewing the pace of the early competitive experience. This type of progression can feed a player positive reinforcement while climbing, only to come to an abrupt stop once they hit their current skill ceiling. Microsoft's true skill was heavily based on Halo 2's multiplayer, created by Josh Mink, and was one of the first matchmaking algorithms to consider the player's ability while looking for a similar matchup. True skill was intended to calculate the average skill of the gamer and the uncertainty of that gamer's skill, utilizing two numbers as opposed to the ELO system's single number. By creating extra variables to assess a player's skill, the team found a 52% accuracy in its ability to predict match outcomes. That led to the development of True Skill 2, which had a 68% accuracy. All this is to say these systems are far from perfect, but they're pretty good. If you grew up playing Halo 2, Halo 3, Gears of War, or Forza, they all utilize True Skill. When we look at modern competitive titles, almost every matchmaking system borrows a lot from the original ELO system. The majority of online multiplayer games use their own modified version to assess a player's skill amongst other individuals. Most games have the rank system that's communicated directly to the player. Some have tiered numerical systems with badges and icons, allowing players to watch their skill rating in real time. They're usually more straightforward, being simpler to understand by providing visuals. Depending on the game, the algorithm uses a much more intricate system of statistics like we mentioned earlier. This is why ranked is typically a separate queue. With all of these factors at play, intentionally throwing a match may give you a bad reputation in the community or even lead to a ban. Many people create YouTube content revolving around throwing matches like 3 Clicks Phillips series on Going Low in CSGO. Unlike in Phillips' case, the only beneficial reason for throwing is the manipulation of the system to give you easier matches. Content creator It's Timmy actually got banned in the middle of his 65-hour Valorant stream for smurfing in the same regard. Because of the player's ability to trick the system, and the secrecy behind how each matchmaking algorithm is crafted, it can be extremely difficult to understand why some matchups occur. At the end of the day, most matchmaking is actually tailored to achieve the best player engagement. Engagement-optimized matchmaking is one of two strategies patented by EA back in 2016, which came soon after Activision's patent to manipulate gamers into buying microtransactions. We all hate EA for being greedy, but Activision hasn't beat here. It boils down to placing players in matches against other players who have paid for skins or items to create a type of FOMO to entice you to also pay for skins and items. That patent seems pretty evil, or at least annoying. The first EA patent is targeted at single player, adjusting difficulty based on performance to keep them engaged. This is a difficulty curve akin to Resident Evil, where the better you do, the harder the game becomes. Except the opposite. For their multiplayer games, they filed another patent under the same EOMM umbrella that will shift the matchmaking by considering factors like skill, sportsmanship, and playstyle. The algorithm will act on what will keep players engaged for longer periods of time as opposed to creating a fair match. 
This concept isn't even remotely surprising since most online games are optimized to keep you coming back and playing for longer. That's not to say fairness and competition take a back seat, as there are plenty of other engagement-based designs like daily objectives, long-term goals, and time-based rewards. One of my favorite channels, Mark Brown with Game Maker's Toolkit, has a fantastic video about keeping gamers engaged. Brown discusses the motivations for playing a game, and none of the reasons are simply dominating an unfair competition. A lack of fairness is one of the least problematic results of these algorithmic matchmaking systems. Because they're always waiting to get similar groups of players together, the average queue times for a match can be annoyingly long. Sometimes, there aren't enough players of a similar skill online, and the game will mesh lobbies causing lower level players to be decimated. This is much more common late at night, as the algorithm is more lenient in its attempt to create a fair match. That's why your teammates are sometimes significantly worse than you. Here's the scenario. A lot of casual gamers get on right after work, and they only play for a few hours. The player pool is much larger during that time, so it's easier to quickly pair average skill players with people close in skill. As the night continues, we see people who are still on late into the night, and they play the game more often, therefore, they're better. Since there's a much smaller pool, and the engagement-optimized matchmaking is prioritizing a low queue time and low latency lobbies, these players could have no choice but to fight our designated professional, Greg. That's when they start complaining about skill-based matchmaking on Twitter and on Reddit. Of course, this Greg is not our only problem. I touched on this earlier, but smurfing is the act of tricking the system into thinking your skill level is lower than what it truly is. While it's a great time for the person doing it, most matchmaking systems almost immediately correct your rating based on how much better you were compared to the rest of the competition. Typically, an individual looking to smurf will create a new account to have a fresh rating and get into beginner lobbies. At the sacrifice of their KD ratio, some people intentionally throw matches to appear much worse than what they are. The algorithm will decide that these matches are less optimal for them, since they appear to be losing each one of them by a significant amount, and put them in easier lobbies to tailor the gaming experience to their perceived skill. Manipulating the system can make your matches more enjoyable for a small amount of time, but it's self-correcting for a reason. Even in a ranked system, a player will find themselves climbing much faster than others and quickly fighting players close to their rank again. It can be argued that a system that only puts similar skill players together will hinder the player's personal progression, but I would argue it's not the dev's responsibility to make players progress in skill. On top of that, these matches don't have to be hard, easy, or even fair. With the information they have, they can intentionally give players a string of fair matches and then one difficult one that may reward more skill points, sort of like a test. CSGO seems to occasionally do this, and the community refers to them as rank up or rank down games. At the end of the day, devs are interested in player engagement and retention, and making a game that everyone can enjoy is the best way to cater to all audiences. Should players become disengaged, they may leave and then the game dies. To this point, I quote Apex Legends developer Eric Hewitt. SBMM will become the norm for most multiplayer games as there's indisputable evidence through data that it helps something like 80 to 90% of the community with retention for most of these games. This quote is a verbal nightmare to content creators, but they fail to understand the truth behind it. Watching YouTubers get tons of kills and dominate the competition is great entertainment for fans who can't do it themselves. That's what makes this type of streamer stand out. It's the reason Dota 2 tournaments can be held in giant stadiums year after year. We love to watch the pros do what the pros do best, and that's win. Being that many of us aren't pros, including myself, of course, we play the receiving end. If you load up a Call of Duty match and get against someone way better than you, they'll kill you over and over. They may even kill you and your friends 112 times and then upload it to YouTube. That's what happened in my party when we played a random match of Black Ops 2 back in 2013. Had the majority of my matches felt like that, I probably wouldn't have played nearly as many hours as I did. The truth is, these systems are great for the longevity of online multiplayer games and extremely helpful to keep the high level competitive while allowing new players to grow at their own pace without becoming disinterested. Humans have a tendency to believe that they're better than others, and that flawed perception is why matchmaking is tailored the way it is, to ensure that everyone wins every now and then. Most of the popular issues with skill-based matchmaking are derived from players who think that they're better than what they are or players who don't understand their skill level. 
Sometimes, someone of a similar skill may have a lucky day and land a series of shots you never thought were possible. We also tend to blame outside factors in our failures, and that's no different here. Now that lag is a bit of a meme complaint, blaming matchmaking is the new trend. It's easy to shrug off a loss as your opponent being significantly better than you. I also want to address the difference between game modes. The casual game mode is just that, casual. Because it doesn't attribute a viewable number or ranking to your performance. Whether you win or lose, you'll still be casual. The reason ranked modes exist is to measure your performance against others, and both still require evenly matched lobbies. Making your rank go up often requires another's to go down. Of course, ranked modes have their own downfalls. Usually my friend group refers to playing the competitive mode in any video game as grinding ranked, and for good reason. Gaining a small amount of points every round is extremely slow progression, and it's only made worse by losing four times as many points in just one match. These publicly shared numbers also encourage boosting, cheating, and exploiting to gain an advantage over the competition. Because of these annoyances, competitive game modes can be extremely exhausting and sometimes toxic. So, let's pause. We've reviewed the lore of skill-based matchmaking, we've seen the structure and we understand what goes into the calculations, we know its use in modern day titles, and we know some of the pros and cons of the algorithm. We ask for balance, but do we know what that looks like? A single kill for every death. Obviously, this is far from possible, much less the truth. With the knowledge that a fair fight wouldn't even be enjoyable, devs don't always look to make things perfectly balanced. Giving your players a couple of good matches where they have a higher likelihood to win will keep them interested even when they lose. I personally find myself disappointed only in myself after a day of losing since I know I was usually the more skilled player and simply lost my engagements. Giving the players harder matches often does end up more frustrating, but I'm sure some programmer somewhere has a reason for why it's good. I just haven't found it yet. I'm joking, of course. While nobody likes to lose, nearing success but falling short could be great for player retention. It satisfies the need for dominance over the competition, but strips it right before the finish line when your opponent pulls a near impossible comeback. Have you ever found yourself saying, I can't end on a loss, and end up playing 16 more losses and eventually end on a whopping 17 loss streak? That is the epitome of retention. Spending all of that time losing all of those points, only to get back on and spend double the amount of time earning them back the next day. In truth, time is much more effective than skill-based matchmaking in shaping a player's experience. As time goes on and the video game gets older, the casual player base naturally dwindles, and lower skill players either quit or get better. Content creators make guides, they give tips, and they encourage lower tier players to learn new strategies. The barrier for entry rises up, increasing the skill floor, closing the gap to the ceiling, and it becomes more difficult to play if you remain stagnant at your level. Setting up engaging matches and avoiding consistent blowouts keeps the game exciting for everyone. To demonstrate this, Destiny 2 will act as a study. For some context, the community here believes Destiny has an internal ELO system for every PvP game mode, which all culminate in the Crucible. This ELO is tracked via destinytracker.com. I use the word believes because Bungie, the developers, have been very quiet about the existence of the system and it's not yet been objectively confirmed. So take the following with a grain of salt. This internal skill rating is only relevant for ranked modes, and skill-based matchmaking is disabled on any other quick play mode. As you can see here, for this quick play match, the individual ratings were wildly skewed, and the team that won had two players that were nearly twice as good as any of the players on our team. Though I did my best and I played a decent game at that, we lost anyway. For the competitive modes that do utilize the ELO systems, you can see that our individual ratings and average team ELO are much more similar to each other. This creates a decent balance that implies that both teams have, at least skillfully, a similar chance at winning. I did some research looking into the community's reactions around the time of the removal of skill-based matchmaking, and the results were as expected. Lower skill players took to the forums to complain about the quality of PvP in the game, feeling like they were getting absolutely crushed in every match. There's always annoying trolls who still comment, get good, but we also see the good players commenting that the game has been more enjoyable for them. Unfortunately, that joy is derived from the sorrow of the average player. The most relevant Reddit thread begins with the comment, 
In eight of the matches of control that I played, six ended in mercies. As a medium skill player, this change has removed almost all of the fun out of the mode for me. Control is a 6v6, capture the zone, quick play mode. Being quick play, it doesn't use skill-based matchmaking. The mercy rule, initiated by Crucible Master Shax himself, is when one of the teams reach 60% of the max score before the opposite team reaches 20%. A beatdown so bad that the match ends early. Three fourths of the matches that this Redditor played resulted in being smacked so heavily that the game itself decided the match was over well before the max score was reached. That is the problem with removing skill-based matchmaking. While the likelihood of getting absolutely obliterated in every single match isn't high, a consecutive string of losses can push away new players, and therefore is bad for the game. Devs usually do their best to improve this system season after season, but the better the system gets, the more difficult your matches will get since players will be just as good as you. But in my opinion, this makes those close victories feel even better. To conclude, skill-based matchmaking is no villain. It is not a necessary evil, or even something worth getting rid of. It's not killing the multiplayer experience, it's actually doing the opposite. Expecting to score easy matches and get easy wins is unrealistic, and asking for the matches to be skewed in your favor is unfair. For every kill you get, someone else has to die, and maybe you'll be the reason that they blame skill-based matchmaking. <laughs>